and we celebrate fathers and sometimes we forget lord that you are the almighty father we're grateful for you we're grateful for all that you do to watch over us all that you do to teach us and the sabbath that you give us to be able to worship and rest so lord thank you for all that i ask you to open the ears and the eyes and the minds and the hearts of the people who are listening in today for a very important topic so, Lord, we just ask you to be with us and let my words be your words as I share the truth of the gospel. We ask all this in your name we pray. Well, the title of the lesson again is How to Start Life Over Again. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to start life over knowing now what you know? You would probably do some things differently. Hopefully, you'd avoid a lot of pitfalls and mistakes. But it is nice to have a fresh start over or a do over, as we say. And I again, I guess that you would do it very differently. Ever notice how small children always seem to be looking ahead, so eager to get into their future? If you ask a child how old they are, they will not tell you that they are four, they will say, I'm four and a half because it's important to them to be older and grow up faster. They want to let you know that they're older. They want to be old enough to go to school. Then they want to be old enough to drive. They want to be old enough to vote, old enough to get a job, old enough to get married. See, children are looking forward to all these big milestones that they see around them happening in life, and they're so eager and anxious to get there. They're anxious to move ahead in life. Did you ever notice how older people always seem to be looking back? They get sentimental about the old days and how great it was and how wonderful the memories were that they got to make. They remember all the wonderful birthdays and family gatherings. They treasured those memories of being together with family and raising children. Some of those maybe not so good, but most of them really good because they had a hand in raising their children. And then, I'd like to say one of the best parts is getting to love your grandchildren. <laughs> so any of us who have grandchildren know that that is just pure joy and love. But we do appreciate those things. We look back on them and those memories are so treasured and precious and how we love to relive those special memories. Of course, not everyone likes looking ahead to the future or looking back to the past. Many people, and you could be one, feel so guilty about things that were done in the past. It doesn't bring great memories. It brings a feeling of guilt and regret over decisions that you may have made or hurtful things that happened in the past, which are really hard to think about sometimes. Some memories make us sad and cause us to feel embarrassed all over again. And not everyone likes looking ahead. There are so many things that are scary about the future ahead, especially in this world. Where will we get money that we need? What will happen to my health? Will I get a cancer diagnosis? What will happen to those that I love? Even concern about our children and our grandchildren and the fact that they will be left behind in this evil world as it only grows more evil and wicked as we see each and every day. So we do get concerned about those things that will be left behind if Jesus does not come before we go to sleep. God tells us not to worry about the past or the future. Worry does not change anything. And in Matthew 6, 25, we are told, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body and what you will wear. Is life not more than food, and the body not more than clothes? In Matthew 6, 34, we are told, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Wouldn't we agree with that? Just getting through a day, we need our energy to get through 
that day. We can't spend our energy on what's going to happen a week from now or, you know, a year from now. We need the energy to get through the day. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could literally go out into the desert, dig a big hole, and drop in everything from the past and just bury it? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be great if we had a new, fresh start in our life? Just bury the old and start with the new one. Well, I'm here to tell you it is possible. You can start life over again. To tell you how, I'll begin by sharing the final words that Jesus spoke before leaving the earth. After ministering here for three and a half years, you know, someone's final words are extremely important, especially if someone is dying. You know, if you've been present when somebody's dying, how important it is to hear the words they're getting ready to share to you. Jesus' farewell to his disciples were so important just before he ascended to heaven. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20 tells us, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen? You can see baptism must be very important for Jesus to have included it in his farewell. Teaching and then baptizing. That was the mission. Baptism is mentioned 80 times in the New Testament. There is so much confusion over the method of baptism. Sprinkling drops of water, usually on a baby. Immersing a baby which the Orthodox do, pouring water over the head of a child, maybe 10 or 11 years old, complete submersion under the water for adults, rose petal baptism, oil baptism, dry hand on a child baptism. I guess that's called the dry cleaning method. But there are many forms of baptism, and people choose to follow that of whatever denomination they're part of. Let's go to the source of truth about all of this. What does the Bible teach about baptism? Is baptism really all that important? Does it make a difference how a person is baptized? Jesus told Nicodemus how important baptism was. In John 3, 5, he says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. So now you hear, it is critically important. It is equally important that you are born of the Holy Spirit as well. It allows your heart to be transformed and changed. So that's just as important as the act of going into baptism is when you come out having the Holy Spirit lead your life. Just being dipped in the water does not miraculously change who you are. It doesn't fix all your problems that day. And as Roberto has mentioned to me several times, it may make it a little worse. You may feel Satan's attacks because now he's mad because you just claim to be God's child. So sometimes when you go through baptism, it doesn't mean everything has been wiped away and you're good to go now. No more problems. I'm God's child. That's not the way it works, nor does God promise that. He knows we'll go through trials. He warned us of that. But critically important is to get the baptism and the Holy Spirit indwelling so that you can try to live a life pleasing to God. Mark 16, 16 says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus links belief with baptism and salvation. What method of baptism does the Bible teach? Ephesians 4, 5 says there is one Lord, 
one faith, one baptism. The Bible says there is only one method of baptism. One Lord, not many gods. One faith, that's one path to salvation through Jesus Christ. And one baptism, one biblical method of baptism. So what is that method? Let's return to the days of Jesus and discover the message. We know when Jesus was on this earth, Jesus came to show us the way. He came to role model for us what it is we should be doing. In Matthew 3, 5, and 6, we read about John the Baptist. Then Jerusalem, all of Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan confessing their sins. John preached out in the desert near the Jordan River. Thousands came and they heard him preach and they confessed their sins. John led them into the Jordan River and baptized them by immersion under the water, symbolizing the cleansing of their sin and forgiveness. It was a death or a burial to your sins. Jesus also came and heard John and came to be baptized, not because he had any sins, because we know he was sinless, but as an example of what we are to do. We also know that John was hesitant to baptize Jesus. He saw that Jesus was holy and righteous. Jesus said to John, let it be so now. In other words, please baptize me now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. I see no reason not to follow the example that Jesus set for us. He did not need it for himself. He wasn't doing it to cleanse himself of sins. He was doing it to show us what baptism is. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, we continue. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. So if he went up out of the water, that means he must have gone down under the water. It is interesting in John 3.23, it says the reason John was baptizing in the Jordan River was because there was much water there. He could have gone to a well and sprinkled some water over people's heads. He could have found all other kinds of alternatives, but he knew that immersion was the way of baptism, and he went to the Jordan River, and that's where he drew the people to so that he could baptize them and baptize Jesus. The verse continues, and a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. As you are being baptized, God also says to you, My beloved daughter or son, in whom I am well pleased. You should go into the baptismal pool with great joy, just knowing that you are pleasing God. The Bible says when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, hovered over him, and he received power from the Holy Spirit. Acts 10.38 tells us, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. At baptism, the new believer comes up out of the water having made a commitment that their new life is going to be in harmony with the principles of the Bible. God gives power through the Holy Spirit to help you follow through with your commitment. Bible baptism was always by immersion, symbolic of death to your old life, since you can't breathe when you're under the water, and raised to a new life when you come up out of the water and you're able to receive air. 
Sprinkling and pouring was never shown in the Bible as methods of baptism. Remember the Ethiopian? He was an intellectual and wealthy man. He was the treasurer to the queen in Ethiopia and came to Jerusalem to, be, to worship. He studied, but he did not understand Isaiah 53 concerning the Messiah. God led Philip to the chariot, and Philip explained it to him. The Ethiopian understood the prophecies and accepted Jesus as the Messiah and the Savior. The Bible says in Acts 8, 36 through 38, Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Notice that both went down into the water. He baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lowered them under the water. The Ethiopian learned the word of God. He learned salvation was only found through Christ. He understood biblical prophecy. Like most of us who study our Bibles and have learned the word of God, we know that Jesus is coming soon. We know God's commandments, and we try to follow them. Even the Bible Sabbath, the fourth commandments. Hence, why we are here today worshiping God on the Sabbath as he commanded in the fourth commandment. You understand what God has said. You study your Bible. Well, God may be leading you to be baptized just as Jesus and the Ethiopian. You may be like me. You may have been raised in a different denomination, but you've known God your entire life. Perhaps like me, you were baptized as a baby in a Catholic church. That was done to me. I didn't choose to have it done, but in the Catholic church, the parents decide that for the child. Or perhaps you had water poured over your head as I have when I changed denominations in another church. As we grow in our knowledge of God's word, we discover what God wants us to know about baptism. I chose to be rebaptized so I could follow Jesus' way of baptism. So yes, the third time was the charm. I was baptized when I heard all this truth and said, whoa, I need to go under that water. I want to die to everything and come up new. So, you know, there is no rule in the Bible that you cannot be rebaptized. There is nothing wrong with that. Claiming that you are now God's child and you want to follow him and you want to do things the way God has instructed, there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm telling you, if you have been baptized previously and you did not know what you're learning or you have found new truth and you would like to recommit yourself through baptism, that is an option that is always open to you, and we would be happy to talk to you about that if you'd like to do that. So I understand what it's like to go through and have someone baptize me, have myself choose to be baptized, and then learn how it's supposed to be done and go get it done right. Baptism is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. We follow Jesus' way. He died, he was buried, and he was raised. So we die with him, we're buried with him, and we're raised with him. We look forward to that ultimate resurrection. Romans 6, 3 says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Romans 6, 4 continues with, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We bury a person when they die. We come to Christ and we die to sin and the habits of our past life. We go into a watery grave symbolized in baptism by the burying of the old man or woman of sin. 
God then gives us a new beginning, and we rise up out of the water, symbolic of the resurrection and our new life. Maybe you've done things years ago, and you don't want anyone to know about it. I'm sure there are probably secrets and guilt of the past that may haunt you. But in a baptismal pool, that past guilt dies, and the guilt is gone. It is dead. You have been forgiven, and your sins are washed away. Your old life died with Christ. What a joy and freedom that you get to experience in starting a fresh, new life with Christ. Baptism symbol is death to our old sinful way of life. We are cleansed through Jesus, who took away a sin through his death so that we can be new in Jesus. The burial of sins into the watery grave of baptism again symbolizes that sins are dead and buried. You know, for some of us, we have a hard time of letting that go. Some of us live in the past. We churn up those memories of guilty things that we've done. Now, we may have asked God to forgive us of those sins, but we truly didn't believe that he did it because we keep asking over and over and over again for forgiveness. God says, don't you believe me? If you ask for forgiveness, you will be forgiven. So we need to bury those sins. Somebody will say or maybe think, well, I'm such a big sinner, I just can't even help myself. God can't forgive me for what I've done or what I keep doing. Whether you're a drug addict, an alcoholic, sexually immoral, or have too much pride, or continually criticize, or gossip, or whatever the sin is that you have, the Bible says... All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of our sins are better or less of a sin than someone else's. Because a sin is a sin. You break one commandment, you've broken them all. So one thing is we never want to judge anyone's sin because we need to take the plank out of our eye before we look at somebody else. We all live in a world full of sin, and we just can't help ourselves. We live in a world where our mind goes drifting off, and we're completely enamored by things in this world. We may see beautiful things we want to have. We may hear something that we want to hear more about that we shouldn't be listening to. There are things that just pull us away, and God says, no, don't go there. Ask every day for the Holy Spirit to come help and guide you and lead you in God's way. It'll help bring your mind into focus. It will help you to drift less. So we do need the Holy Spirit, and that is part of what happens after baptism. We have the Holy Spirit anointing us to help us walk in the ways that we should go. But God, again, forgives all sin, and we can't keep living in the past of the sins of the past. In baptism, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I claim the grace of God is sufficient to save me, and I ask for his mercy. I invite him to come take over my life. You maybe haven't done such a great job running your life, and maybe you're now ready to turn it over to God and let God control your life. He absolutely knows what's best for you. So why not let God have a try? Baptism is a, devoiding, is a dividing point in life. You get to start over. It's like getting a do-over. You die to your past life and you're resurrected to a new life in Christ. This time you commit to following Christ and obeying his will. God promises it will lead you to a better outcome. If you've ever visited old churches and many in other parts of the world, they will reveal the true method of baptism. Let's visit some of the early churches. Our first stop is in Philippi. Paul established an early church there in the first century. These ruins date back to the fourth century. You can see the baptistry, which would have been filled with water, and people would have been fully immersed in their baptism. Now we go to Rome. 
the Church of St. John Lateran, the second and most famous church in the world. In the back is the baptistry. Adult believers were baptized by immersion. Let's now visit the famous architectural mon monument that you can see on the screen. Most of you know who, what this is. This is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. In the back of the Leaning Tower is a baptistry where Roman Catholic friends for 1,300 years were baptized as adult believers by immersion. In Cappadocia, in the interior of Turkey, during the Middle Ages, the church and the state united. Christians fled here for safety. They carved entire cities in the mountains. There were homes, barns, stores, warehouses, and chapels. Here inside the mountain is a church with a baptistry. So Christians in the Middle Ages practiced baptism by immersion. They never did what was convenient. They didn't sprinkle or just pour a little water. They knew it had to be the way God had shown it. They took the time to build a baptistry so people could be immersed in their baptism. They wanted to be baptized in like manner that Jesus was. Moscow's Red Square has the St. Basil's Cathedral. In St. Basil's, in the early paintings, we see the Prince of Russia, Vladimir the Great, being baptized by immersion in 1088 AD. Let's go to Geneva, Switzerland, in the headquarters of the World Council of Churches. There is a fresco from Africa from the fourth century. The fresco portrays Jesus' baptism. The fourth century Christians understood baptism is by immersion. This is also how the Ethiopian was baptized. Baptism in the Bible is done after people accept Christ and after they repent of their sins. There is no reference in scripture for the baptisms of babies because babies would have a difficult time telling us they accept Christ and asking for forgiveness of their sins. It was not until the Council of Ravenna in AD 1311 that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. It was 1300 years after Christ without any biblical support that the church decided to accept baptism by sprinkling or pouring. Until this time, people were immersed. We also know during the early centuries, many practices and beliefs not found in the Bible entered the Christian church. Other practices and beliefs such as the immortal soul entered through paganism. If that's the first time you're hearing that, come see us. We would love to share a Bible study on that. The Bible teaches when you die, you sleep until Jesus comes. The Bible teaches the seventh day is the Sabbath. Sunday keeping entered the church through pagan influence. We have to look at how we practice and what we believe and see if the foundation of that is found in God's word alone and not in man-made changes. Why did sprinkling enter priests were called to the bedside of a dying person? They knew that Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Some people neglected baptism and perhaps they were too sick to be baptized by immersion. So the priests wrapped them from head to toe in wet towels. Even this became inconvenient. So some priests began to sprinkle people. It came down to being more of a convenience. When did baptism of babies begin? The church concluded that babies are guilty of Adam's sin. If they died unbaptized, they couldn't be saved since they carried the guilt of Adam. What kind of God who loves children so much 
would punish a baby who was too young to repent and not give the baby a chance to enter heaven. We have to ask ourselves, do we know the God we serve? Would God do that to the babies that he so treasures and cherishes knowing that they're his? Certainly not, at least not the God we serve. So the origin of baptism by sprinkling was for the dying where immersion was difficult or impossible and for infants because of the sin of Adam. Both reasons are unsupported in the Bible. Bible baptism was never a symbol for the forgiveness of Adam's sin. My baptism is a symbol that I accept Jesus. He has redeemed me as a believer. Baptism is a symbol of walking in the footsteps of Christ. Therefore, a baby cannot believe, repent, and be instructed to follow Christ as newborn and young, young babies are. What does baptism mean? The Greek word baptize means to dip, to immerse, to plunge under water. The very word baptism does not mean sprinkling or pouring. A friend met a Greek gentleman in a restaurant and asked him, what does baptism mean in Greek? He took a piece of a donut, he plunged it into the coffee cup. There, I just baptized the donut. So he knew what baptism was. It was full immersion. Baptism in the Bible always means totally under the water and immersed. The Bible asks the next question in Acts 2.37. Men and brethren, what shall we do? How do you know if you're ready for baptism? How do you know if God is leading you? The Bible lists three steps to salvation. First is to repent. The Bible says when we come to Jesus, we repent. We say, Lord, you died on that cross for me. I'm sorry for all that I have done wrong. Repentance means a change of attitude towards sin. It's not saying, I'm sorry, Lord, and then go out and doing it again because you didn't repent. You basically stated something and then went back and did it again. So repentance means a change of attitude towards sin. Hence, why we need the Holy Spirit to come and help us because our earthly bodies would lead us to go back and do the same thing over and over again. So we need God's help, and we know God's helper is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Here again, we would ask if a baby is old enough to repent, and the answer is no. A baby cannot make those decisions. The second step to salvation is to believe. The Bible says in Acts 8.37, one comes to Christ and then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. So after you repent of sin, you accept faith by believing Christ died for you. Christ will forgive you of your sins, and he will come into your life and change you to be more like him. The Bible says you repent, you believe, and then thirdly, you learn. The Bible says before baptism, we learn. Acts 2.41 says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. You are here purposefully to receive God's word. The truth that Jesus is coming and every eye will see him when he comes, there is salvation only through the grace of Christ. Christ can change your life no matter the past that you've had. We have said before that we're living in the judgment hour just before the coming of Jesus. If we love him, 
we will keep his commandments. We will keep his Sabbath day holy. There are so many biblical truths that you need to know and follow. We cover many of these in detail in each of these lessons that we do each Sabbath. So I'm hoping that some of you, if you're hearing something new and you have questions, feel free to approach myself or Ellie or the elders or the pastors in the church, and we would be happy to help dialogue and get better understanding of what we believe from a biblical standpoint and where it can be found in the Bible. Here are the steps to baptism. When we come to Christ, number one, we repent. A genuine sorrow for our sins. Two, we believe by accepting Christ as our Savior and Lord. And three, we learn the essentials of biblical faith. When we make a decision to be baptized, we know that God perhaps brought you here for this time to hear this message. It's not by chance that you're hearing this. If you've not been baptized, or if you have been baptized but did not understand this truth, then we would be happy to talk to you about a rebaptism. It is dangerous to wait knowing the truth and not having the faith to move forward. Now could be your time to step out and show your faith in Christ. Some ask, does baptism mean becoming part of Christ's church? I want to be baptized, but I don't want to join any specific church. What does the Bible have to say about that? The Bible says in Acts 2, 47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Well, what body is that? That's the church. Colossians 1.18 tells us, and he is the head of the body, the church. Church is the only organization that is so large, considered the body on earth, just as Christ is the head of the church in heaven and on earth. The church is God-made. It is not man-made. You are not being baptized into a man-made organization but God's church. We are baptized, and then we become part of God's commandment-keeping people, just awaiting the second coming of Christ to bring us to our eternal heavenly home. Amen? Are we excited to go there? We're excited for that resurrection. Jesus commanded his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus added, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Then he promises, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. It is thrilling to see people respond to the Holy Spirit. There are places that have been very difficult to preach, and the Bible is forbidden, but it is now open. There are places such as Cuba where doors have been opened with nationwide crusades. All across the beautiful island, the gospel was preached. At the close of the the public was invited to accept Jesus, repent, and be baptized. The group was so large that they went to the beach and they went to pools to be baptized. Over 3,000 precious souls were baptized. Thousands more made decisions to prepare for baptism. On the other side of the world, in Papua New Guinea, in the interior highlands of Goroka, about 60,000 people gathered. You see how hungry people are for God's word. We have a hard time in America just filling the seats in a church, and these people come by the thousands to just soak up God's word. There was an open study of God's word. The people slept on the ground for 10 days 
to stay there and hear the preaching. One afternoon at a nearby river, thousands were baptized. There were so many you couldn't even see the entire group being baptized as there were too many people. Finally, from a helicopter, there was such a thrilling sight, so many precious souls being baptized. The Bible says in Acts 22, 16, any now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why do you wait, my brothers and sisters in Christ? Is there anything that you should be waiting for? Have you accepted Jesus? Decide to be baptized and wash away all those sins. If you say, I was already baptized as a baby, as I have done, you could learn that babies could not be properly baptized. We just talked about the steps for baptism, and babies can't do those steps. They are precious babies. But you now, as an adult, can make that decision. You know the steps. You can repent. You can believe. And you certainly are here learning by listening. And you can follow God's commandments, and you can be baptized. Arise and be baptized the biblical way, Jesus' way. If you were immersed as a baby or a child, that wasn't your belief. That was your parents' belief. Now you can stand and make the decision yourself. God says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. You might say, I was already baptized. Should I be rebaptized? If you're hearing new truths in God's word, we know in Acts 19, it is good to be immersed a second time, since now you have the fullness of truth. Perhaps you want to be rebaptized because you have drifted away from the church. That happens quite often, especially when people are young. They may be in church because their parents instructed them to do so. And as obedient children, they sat in church. But once they tasted freedom, when they went off to college or otherwise, they may have drifted away. And even as adults, we see a lot of adults drift away from the church, maybe for several years. Maybe they even separated or severed their relationship with God. It is time to return and make a commitment again. God never says you don't get a second chance until you take your last breath. So while you're breathing, you get another chance. You have an opportunity to make another decision. Perhaps you're thinking, well, I'm a faithful Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Catholic, or maybe I'm non-denominational Christian. I've loved Jesus, but I've learned some new truths. What do I do now? The Bible says, go you, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you. After listening and following these seminars, perhaps you've learned new truths, maybe about the Sabbath, maybe about the state of the dead, and maybe you have a better understanding of the commitment that God has for you by following the commandments found in his word. You may want to be cleansed from the errors you've been making in following man and tradition instead of following God only. Come and re be rebaptized. This is your time. In the days of ancient Israel, Israel was led from Egypt. God commanded the blood of a sacrificial lamb to be applied to the doorpost. And if the blood was there, then the angel of death would fly over or pass that home. We know that story in the Bible. The boy says to his father, I understand all the firstborn will be slain. Father, I'm the firstborn. Is the blood on the doorpost? Father says, not yet, but I will. 
the son says, but father, I'm worried. It's just a symbol, son, says the father. The son pleads, father, please put the blood on the doorpost. The blood on the doorpost was just a symbol that Christ is in the home. This made an angel of death pass it by. It was a symbol, but as you read, it was a vitally important symbol. Baptism is a symbol, but it's also a vitally important one. Have you repented of your sin? Do you believe Christ is your savior? If you do, then don't wait. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow, or even this afternoon for that matter. Make a decision to follow him in baptism. You can walk into the water with all your sins and your guilt, and they can all be gone because God will forgive you if you repent. You can come up out of the water with a fresh, clean start. You can say now that you want to follow in Jesus' footsteps, and you want to make that proclamation through baptism. Please give yourself this gift from God, the gift of salvation and to be cleansed of your past and filled with the newness of the Holy Spirit. Before I conclude, I always like to share things that I use as resources. Many of you sit here and come to these presentations, watch online or listen, and sometimes you're like, that was really good, but I could not say all that. I couldn't tell a friend all the things you just told me, and nor can I remember all those Bible verses you just quoted. So I always like to share references. This is a tool that I find very handy that you could purchase. It's called Studying Together. It is a ready reference Bible handbook. It was written by Mark Finley. There's a revised version out there. And in this, it's amazing. It's a small book, but it's very powerful. It, it had lists Bible studies that you can give by topic. So very quick and easy Bible studies. They're all just a couple pages. And then it lists every Bible verse that supports that. And then it also goes through practical Christianity and principles and how to deal with things like anger and bitterness and things like that that people are dealing with today and how you can help them. And then in the back, which I really like, it's understanding churches, denominations, and religious groups. It helps you understand what a Baptist believe, Buddhists, Catholics, Hindus, Islam, Muslims, Jews, Lutherans. It tells you what they believe and how you would approach that. So all that is packed in this incredibly powerful book. And I, I tabbed this one because I wanted to pull the Bible verses for baptism. So there's a whole little two pages on baptism of Bible verses that you can reference if you want to talk to somebody about baptism. Real easy, all in one place. You don't have to memorize it all. Um, and I'm good at pulling up reference materials. Ellie and I talk about that all the time. The minute we find something, we're like, you got to get this book. Um, there's so many good materials out there that make it easy for you. Because not everybody spends 24 hours a day studying and memorizing the Bible. Although not a bad idea, because when we're living in the end times, we need to be able to pull that scripture from our heart and our mind. And we won't have maybe paper in front of us. But... I would say this will help you to retain it more and more the more you use it and share it with other people. So just a great little book. If anybody wants to order that, you can go on and find that book, Studying Together, a ready reference Bible handbook. But it is something very handy and, and helpful for people who just need to have something at their fingertips, and it's not very large. I'm sure they probably have an online version. We're in the dig digital age now but I haven't quite gotten there 100%, um, but that, that is available to you. I hope some of you listening have heard something that causes you to think and ponder and repent and ask God to lead you in the way that you should go, and he will. I hope that some of you maybe did not understand what you were doing when you got baptized. Maybe you didn't understand the significance of it. Maybe you got baptized in a different way, and you'd like to now get baptized by immersion. We would love to talk to you about that. We have several baptisms in this church every year. So we would love to talk to you about that. So 
If you would, um, let me close us today in prayer. Let's bow. Dear Father, there are souls out there that are listening and hearing this and maybe now are a little bit more inspired to follow you, to come to you and ask you what is it that they should do. Lord, they may know you. They may have followed you their whole life, but maybe they didn't make the commitment to be baptized. And Lord, we know what you say about it. Your Bible is very clear. And Lord, maybe there are some that have never been baptized or some that have been baptized and maybe didn't fully understand what was going on through the entire baptism. So Lord, I just ask you to allow them to have the strength and give them the courage to step up and say, I'm ready, I would like to do this. Let them make that commitment in front of your church, Lord, so that we can come along beside them and encourage them. Let us be the ones that help guide them here while they're here on earth to come to you and be closer to you and have a relationship with you, Lord. Let us be those that get used as a vessel for you in that way. Lord, we ask you to be with Ellie as she delivers our message today. And Lord, we just thank you for all the men and all the fathers in our church today. We are grateful that you gave us man and that we are here to celebrate them today. We ask all this in your name we pray. Amen.